Chapter 11, Things New and Old Based on Matthew 13, verses 51 and 52. While Christ was teaching the people, he was also educating his disciples for their future work. In all his instruction there were lessons for them. After giving the parable of the net, he asked them, Have ye understood all these things? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then in another parable he set before them their responsibility in regard to the truths they had received. Therefore, he said, Every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. The treasure gained by the householder he does not hoard. He brings it forth to communicate to others, and by use the treasure increases. The householder has precious things, both new and old, so Christ teaches that the truth committed to his disciples is to be communicated to the world, and as the knowledge of truth is imparted, it will increase. All who receive the gospel message into the heart will long to proclaim it. The heaven-born love of Christ must find expression. Those who have put on Christ will relate their experience, tracing step by step the leadings of the Holy Spirit. Their hungering and thirsting for the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ whom He has sent, the results of their searching of the Scriptures, their prayers, their soul agony, and the words of Christ to them, Thy sins be forgiven thee. It is unnatural for any to keep these things secret, and those who are filled with the love of Christ will not do so. In proportion as the Lord has made them the depositaries of sacred truth will be their desire that others shall receive the same blessing. And as they make known the rich treasures of God's grace, more and still more of the grace of Christ will be imparted to them. They will have the heart of a little child in its simplicity and unreserved obedience. Their souls will pant after holiness, and more and more of the treasures of truth and grace will be revealed to them to be given to the world. The great storehouse of truth is the Word of God, the written Word, the book of nature, and the book of experience in God's dealing with human life. Here are the treasures from which Christ's workers are to draw. In the search after truth, they are to depend upon God, not upon human intelligences, the great men whose wisdom is foolishness with God. Through his own appointed channels, the Lord will impart a knowledge of himself to every seeker. If the follower of Christ will believe his word and practice it, There is no science in the natural world that he will not be able to grasp and appreciate. There is nothing but that will furnish him means for imparting the truth to others. Natural science is a treasure house of knowledge from which every student in the school of Christ may draw. As we contemplate the beauty of nature, as we study its lessons in the cultivation of the soil, in the growth of the trees, in all the wonders of earth and sea and sky, there will come to us a new perception of truth, and the mysteries connected with God's dealings with men, the depths of his wisdom and judgment as seen in human life, these are found to be a storehouse rich in treasure. But it is in the written word that a knowledge of God is most clearly revealed to fallen man. This is the treasure house of the unsearchable riches of Christ. The Word of God includes the scriptures of the Old Testament as well as of the New. One is not complete without the other. Christ declared that the truths of the Old Testament are as valuable as those of the New. Christ was as much man's Redeemer in the beginning of the world as he is today. Before he clothed his divinity with humanity and came to our world, the gospel message was given by Adam, Seth, Enoch, Methuselah, and Noah. Abraham in Canaan, and Lot in Sodom bore the message, and from generation to generation faithful messengers proclaimed the coming one. The rights of the Jewish economy were instituted by Christ himself. He was the foundation of their system of sacrificial offerings, the great antitype of all their religious service. The blood shed as the sacrifices were offered 
pointed to the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, all the typical offerings were fulfilled in him. Christ, as manifested to the patriarchs, as symbolized in the sacrificial service, as portrayed in the law, and as revealed by the prophets, is the riches of the Old Testament. Christ in his life, his death, and his resurrection, Christ as he is manifested by the Holy Spirit, is the treasure of the New Testament. Our Savior, the outshining of the Father's glory, is both the old and the new. Of Christ's life and death and intercession, which prophets had foretold, the apostles were to go forth as witnesses. Christ in his humiliation, in his purity and holiness, in his matchless love, was to be their theme. And in order to preach the gospel in its fullness, they must present the Savior not only as revealed in his life and teachings, but as foretold by the prophets of the Old Testament and as symbolized by the sacrificial service. Christ in his teaching presented old truths of which he himself was the originator, truths which he had spoken through patriarchs and prophets, but he now shed upon them a new light. How different appeared their meaning! A flood of light and spirituality was brought in by his explanation, and he promised that the Holy Spirit should enlighten the disciples, that the Word of God should be ever unfolding to them. They would be able to present its truths in new beauty. Ever since the first promise of redemption was spoken in Eden, the life, the character, and the mediatorial work of Christ have been the study of human minds. Yet every mind through whom the Holy Spirit has worked has presented these themes in a light that is fresh and new. The truths of redemption are capable of constant development and expansion. Though old, they are ever new, constantly revealing to the seeker for truth a greater glory and a mightier power. In every age there is a new development of truth, a message of God to the people of that generation. The old truths are all essential. New truth is not independent of the old, but an unfolding of it. It is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. When Christ desired to open to his disciples the truth of his resurrection, he began at Moses and all the prophets, and expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Luke twenty four twenty seven. But it is the light which shines in the fresh unfolding of truth that glorifies the old. He who rejects or neglects the new does not really possess the old. For him it loses its vital power and becomes but a lifeless form. There are those who profess to believe and to teach the truths of the Old Testament while they reject the new. But in refusing to receive the teachings of Christ, they show that they do not believe that which patriarchs and prophets have spoken. Had ye believed Moses, Christ said, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. John 5.46 Hence there is no real power in their teaching of even the Old Testament. Many who claim to believe and teach the gospel are in a similar error. They set aside the Old Testament scripture, of which Christ declared, They are they which testify of me. John 5.39 In rejecting the old, they virtually reject the new, for both are parts of an inseparable whole. No man can rightly present the law of God without the gospel, or the gospel without the law. The law is the gospel embodied, and the gospel is the law unfolded. The law is the root, the gospel is the fragrant blossom and fruit which it bears. The Old Testament sheds light upon the new, and the new upon the old. Each is a revelation of the glory of God in Christ. Both present truths that will continually reveal new depths of meaning to the earnest seeker. Truth in Christ and through Christ is measureless. The student of Scripture looks, as it were, into a fountain that deepens and broadens as he gazes into its depths. Not in this life shall we comprehend the mystery of God's love 
in giving his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The work of our Redeemer on this earth is and ever will be a subject that will put to the stretch our highest imagination. Man may tax every mental power in the endeavor to fathom this mystery, but his mind will become faint and weary. The most diligent searcher will see before him a boundless, shoreless sea. The truth as it is in Jesus can be experienced, but never explained. Its height and breadth and depth pass our knowledge. We may task our imagination to the utmost, and then we shall see only dimly the outlines of a love that is unexplainable, that is as high as heaven, but that stooped to the earth to stamp the image of God on all mankind. Yet it is possible for us to see all that we can bear of the divine compassion. This is unfolded to the humble, contrite soul. We shall understand God's compassion just in proportion as we appreciate His sacrifice for us. As we search the Word of God in humility of heart, the grand theme of redemption will open to our research. It will increase in brightness as we behold it, and as we aspire to grasp it, its height and depth will ever increase. Our life is to be bound up with the life of Christ, we are to draw constantly from Him, partaking of Him, the living bread that came down from heaven, drawing from a fountain ever fresh, ever giving forth its abundant treasures. If we keep the Lord ever before us, allowing our hearts to go out in thanksgiving and praise to Him, we shall have a continual freshness in our religious life. Our prayers will take the form of a conversation with God as we would talk with a friend. He will speak his mysteries to us personally. Often there will come to us a sweet, joyful sense of the presence of Jesus. Often our hearts will burn within us as he draws nigh to commune with us as he did with Enoch. When this is in truth the experience of the Christian, there is seen in his life a simplicity, a humility, meekness, and lowliness of heart that show to all with whom he associates that he has been with Jesus and learned of him. In those who possess it, the religion of Christ will reveal itself as a vitalizing, pervading principle, a living, working, spiritual energy. There will be manifest the freshness and power and joyousness of perpetual youth. The heart that receives the word of God is not as a pool that evaporates, not like a broken cistern that loses its treasure, it is like the mountain stream fed by unfailing springs whose cool, sparkling waters leap from rock to rock, refreshing the weary, the thirsty, the heavy laden. This experience gives every teacher of truth the very qualifications that will make him a representative of Christ. The Spirit of Christ's teaching will give a force and directness to his communications, and to his prayers. His witness to Christ will not be a narrow, lifeless testimony. The minister will not preach over and over the same set discourses. His mind will be open to the constant illumination of the Holy Spirit. Christ said, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. As the living Father hath sent me, I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6, verses 54 to 63. When we eat Christ's flesh and drink his blood, the element of eternal life will be found in the ministry. There will not be a fund of stale, oft-repeated ideas. The tame, dull sermonizing will cease. The old truths will be presented, but they will be seen in a new light. There will be a new perception of truth, a clearness and a power that all will discern. Those who have the privilege of sitting under such a ministry will, if susceptible to the Holy Spirit's influence, feel the energizing power of a new life. The fire of God's love will be kindled within them. Their perceptive faculties will be quickened to discern the beauty and majesty of truth. 
The faithful householder represents what every teacher of the children and youth should be. If he makes the Word of God his treasure, he will continually bring forth new beauty and new truth. When the teacher will rely upon God in prayer, the Spirit of Christ will come upon him, and God will work through him by the Holy Spirit upon the minds of others. The Spirit fills the mind and heart with sweet hope and courage and Bible imagery, and all this will be communicated to the youth under his instruction. The springs of heavenly peace and joy, unsealed in the soul of the teacher by the words of inspiration, will become a mighty river of influence to bless all who connect with him. The Bible will not become a tiresome book to the student. Under a wise instructor, the word will become more and more desirable. It will be as the bread of life and will never grow old. Its freshness and beauty will attract and charm the children and youth. It is like the sun shining upon the earth, perpetually imparting brightness and warmth, yet never exhausted. God's holy educating spirit is in his word. A light, a new and precious light, shines forth from every page. Truth is there revealed, and words and sentences are made bright and appropriate for the occasion as the voice of God speaking to the soul. The Holy Spirit loves to address the youth and to discover to them the treasures and beauties of God's Word. The promises spoken by the great teacher will captivate the senses and animate the soul with a spiritual power that is divine. There will grow in the fruitful mind a familiarity with divine things that will be as a barricade against temptation. The words of truth will grow in importance and assume a breadth and fullness of meaning of which we have never dreamed. The beauty and riches of the word have a transforming influence on mind and character. The light of heavenly love will fall upon the heart as an inspiration. The appreciation of the Bible grows with its study. Whichever way the student may turn, he will find display the infinite wisdom and love of God. The significance of the Jewish economy is not yet fully comprehended. Truths vast and profound are shadowed forth in its rites and symbols. The gospel is the key that unlocks its mysteries. Through a knowledge of the plan of redemption, its truths are open to the understanding. Far more than we do, it is our privilege to understand these wonderful themes. We are to comprehend the deep things of God. Angels desire to look into the truths that are revealed to the people who with contrite hearts are searching the word of God and praying for greater lengths and breadths and depths and heights of the knowledge which he alone can give. As we near the close of this world's history, the prophecies relating to the last days especially demand our study. The last book of the New Testament scriptures is full of truth that we need to understand. Satan has blinded the minds of many so that they have been glad of any excuse for not making the revelation their study. But Christ, through his servant John, has here declared what shall be in the last days, and he says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. Revelation 1 verse 3. This is life eternal, Christ said that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John 17, 3. Why is it that we do not realize the value of this knowledge? Why are not these glorious truths glowing in our hearts, trembling upon our lips, and pervading our whole being? In giving us his word, God has put us in possession of every truth essential for our salvation. Thousands have drawn water from these wells of life, yet there is no diminishing of the supply. Thousands have set the Lord before them, and by beholding have been changed into the same image. Their spirit burns within them as they speak of his character, telling what Christ is to them and what they are to Christ. But these searchers have not exhausted these grand and holy themes." Thousands more may engage in the work of searching out the mysteries of salvation. As the life of Christ and the character of his mission are dwelt upon, 
rays of light will shine forth more distinctly at every attempt to discover truth. Each fresh search will reveal something more deeply interesting than has yet been unfolded. The subject is inexhaustible. The study of the incarnation of Christ, His atoning sacrifice, and mediatorial work will employ the mind of the diligent student as long as time shall last, and looking to heaven with its unnumbered years, he will exclaim, Great is the mystery of godliness. In eternity we shall learn that which, had we received the enlightenment it was possible to obtain here, would have opened our understanding. The themes of redemption will employ the hearts and minds and tongues of the redeemed through the everlasting ages. They will understand the truths which Christ longed to open to his disciples, but which they did not have faith to grasp. Forever and forever, new views of the perfection and glory of Christ will appear. Through endless ages will the faithful householder bring forth from his treasure things new and old.